dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published, all at the same time. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research Featured study focuses uh, on Global Skills Partnership or GSPs a solution to address these concerns. GSPs could connect workers' uh, skills development in developing countries with labor mobility opportunities, uh, creating mutually beneficial arrangements from origi for origin and uh, destination nations. Study analyzes existing programs and recommends successful, scalable, and sustainable implementation. We are fortunate to have Dr. Pablo Acosta presenting his study titled The Promise of Global Skills Partnerships for Win-Win Migration Outcomes. He is the lead economist at the Social Protection and Jobs Global Unit and the Global Lead for Migration. He holds a PhD in economics from University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, since joining the bank in 2008, he has worked in multiple regions, including uh, four years in the Philippines. I worked with him with, on four-piece labor market and socio-emotional skills. Uh, uh, research here in the country and held positions at CAF Latin America Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and the Argentina's Ministry of Economy. His expertise includes social protection, labor policy, migration, and skills development. He has published widely and is a research fellow at the Institute for Labor Studies, RISA. Pablo, you have the floor.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Orbeta, uh, close friends as well, and thanks for inviting me to, to Pitts. I also had us the pleasure to be before here during my stay. Uh, every time we were having interesting research, we were invited to Pitts, and, and hopefully today is also of interest in my new role. I cover uh, the area of migration now at the bank, and um, we think it's a, we are at the moment, a monumental moment in this in this topic, not just because of the demographic trends that Professor Orbeta just mentioned, but also because uh, we are seeing, on the other hand, still a lot of political uh, discourse that need to be overcome and be hopefully dominated by economics. Right? I mean, Philippines, of course, is a country that has embraced migration and, and development uh, quite so long. And, and many countries are also trying to, to learn from you. Um, you see even the presentation, and apologies, I didn't have time to change the title, but we just came before Manila to uh, an, a large East Asian Pacific Migration Conference in Bangkok, where we met officials from, from many countries and researchers, including also from the Philippines. So basically the, the, main, the, main, the main idea here is to raise awareness and of course uh, present solutions to governments, including the concept that I will explain later on global skill partnerships. That again is Manila, uh, Philippines, I mean, is a, it's a country that is at the front on this, uh, but uh, for other countries, they still need to, to learn that pathway. So let me start a bit with the context and, um, and hopefully uh, for those who follow the migration uh, work and agenda, they were aware that in 2023, the World Bank released the World Development Report, which is usually the, is basically the main publication that uh, the bank has every year. And it changes the topic, no? It's defined by the board. Uh, and, uh, and last year was on migration, refugees, and societies. So that tells you the importance that, that in the World Bank we're giving to, to the topic. Uh, and it start with, you know, aside from many definitions and this varies also with other UN agencies that are, as well are looking into different concepts, but overall uh, we are defining migrants and someone who is not citizen of the country they're living on. And, uh, and if, you, if you take that definition, we're talking about 2.3% of the world population of 180 million people. Um, as you see, it's, it's quite evenly uh, uh, distributed, these migrants. Half of them are in high-income countries, the other half pretty much on low- and middle-income countries. And uh, despite uh, sometimes the, the news are focusing specifically on refugees because these are the hardest uh, type of, of migrants that are being forcibly displaced, and they suffer, of course, a lot of deprivations and access to services, etc. The large majority of the people that migrate, as you know, as Filipinos, are the economic migrants, people that migrate for economic opportunities, not so much for forcibly uh, displaced reasons. Uh, the distribution, of course, is interesting because when you look at the uh, immigrants in destination and uh, as, a, as a share of the population, the, this is basically the countries that receive most of these migrants are not surprisingly those who are uh, highly developed. And this is basically the two maps that we, we show here is the share of immigrants in destination countries, but at the same time, we also use the Human Development Index. And you see the countries we are always looking at is North America, Europe, the Gulf countries, uh, in East Asia and the Pacific, especially uh, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and, and these are basically the, the, the countries that are highly developed in the world. No? And again, that's the reason people are moving mostly for to get a better economic living and economic opportunity. In East Asia and the Pacific, of course, we need to distinguish between those high income countries and the others. Uh, but overall, you see that the flows, so that's the distribution of, um, of, of, of where uh, are coming into the country, into the countries and where they are going. Uh, we have to say that intra-regional migration in East Asia is lower compared to other regions. So you have a lot of intra-regional migration in continents like Africa, Europe, Latin America. In that comparison, East Asia and the Pacific is, is, is mostly uh, going to from East Asia and the Pacific to other regions, especially the North America and the Gulf countries. Um, there are some going into, into, destina into other destinations, especially from uh, lower and middle income countries in East Asia, going to upper middle income and upper middle income and higher income countries in East Asia. As I mentioned before, Australia, New Zealand, 
you are Singapore, Japan, and, and Korea. These are basically the main destinations of, of, of in, in the in among the high income countries. But still, uh, you see that uh, it's a very large proportion are going to outside the region. And this is a phenomenon that uh, uh, you know, it's interesting to understand. And especially in the conference, we were you know, highlighting why, why are so relatively limited opportunities uh, in, to move within the region, especially with, within ASEAN and also uh, higher income countries that should uh, ideally open up more to migrants. And of course, we are looking specifically at countries like Japan and Korea that we've seen, and eventually China that we've seen will also uh, could potentially absorb more migrants from the region. Uh, in terms of uh, skills, apologies, this is not, this is a, a we wanted to do the, the same analysis in East Asia and the Pacific, but we don't have it handy. But basically, this is this is mirroring across the world that when you look at the, the migrants, which type of education and skills they have, you see basically that uh, when we compare the education of the migrants with respect to the native population in US or Western Europe, the majority of them are uh, tend to be um, have lower skills in terms of no education on primary, but also some of them a higher skills than the than the, the native population. So the two extremes. What uh, basically the, the difference is, is in the middle type of skill, the middle type of education, where not so many migrants are, are migrating in this condition. So basically there was those who are migrating to these uh, destinations come from both either the very low skill side or the high high end skill set. In particular, also we see that many of them are uh, migrating with tertiary education, and EAP here is is one of the regions where uh, the majority that people that migrate for economic reasons have high tertiary education. Right? Uh, this compares in uh, for those who are coming from high income countries in East Asia and the Pacific, but also even for those who are coming from low income countries. For low-income countries, also there is an, a significant share that have no education. These are the low-skilled migrants, and they are also uh, predominant in EAP. But uh, the interesting fact is that, um, especially among the high-skilled uh, migrants, uh, East Asia uh, stands up. No, and not surprisingly, the the main uh, uh, benefits from migration are related to remittances. To the, you are in a country that is, is is also one of the most the top receiving remittance countries in the world, not so much as a share of GDP or as a percentage of income like in the Pacific countries, which of course they are smaller economies, and so re remittances represent a much larger high uh, uh, share. But uh, but yes, uh, of course, in the in terms of uh, of uh, among the higher countries, higher income countries, uh, sorry, among the higher uh, population countries you are one of the top in that sense, the Philippines, Mexico, uh, India, and, uh, and Bangladesh. Um, in migrant corridors, of course, the graph on the left, not surprising, we were monitoring a, a bit the, the gains that the migrants have. And, uh, and overall, depending on the corridor you see, uh, migrants are able to increase their income up to 200, 300% uh, from what they used to earn when they were back home. So that's basically significant gains that allows them, of course, also to, to send remittances back home. The shift that we are, and, and now we are gonna enter into the, the trajectory of what are the outlook that we are seeing for migration. Uh, so, so far I've been talking about the past, and now we are trying to anticipate a bit what is gonna look like in the future. And um, among the different uh, trends that the world is experiencing in terms of climate change, technological change, uh, we have conflict growing, uh, in many in many regions and and these are also all of them are gonna potentially push people to other to across borders. The one that very few people are talking as a significant uh, uh, aspect that is gonna is gonna define the future of migration the, is related to the demographic transition. So what you see here is the evolution of the uh, the different uh, groups of countries according to level of income. And you will see that basically in the in, we are in 2025 almost, so basically the middle here, right? Uh, so you see that countries like high income countries are already entering into the decline phase in population. It, the more important and significant shift we're going to see is the decline in population in upper middle income countries. Um, 
and, uh, and this is basically the countries that tended to supply most of the migrants to the high income countries. These are the Mexicos of the world, the Turkey, Morocco, uh, eventually Philippines as well, uh, with, a, with a very low fertility rate, as, as I understand was recorded in the last year. Philippines will enter also soon into a declining demographic stage. On the other hand, the countries that are, will continue to grow for a while are the low and middle income countries, and especially the low income countries. And these are most, most of them located in sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to talk a bit about that. And that is kind of the, the shift that we will see in the, in the, in, in the, in the population uh, growth uh, very soon and how this is going to define the migration patterns. This is another way to show you that basically this is a global dependency ratio. So the number of dependents uh, we have uh, as a share of the active population, no? the people that are working. And, uh, and, and of course, you see in the past, especially until the 60s, most of the dependency ratio was increasing faster, especially after the baby boomers started to be to have more, 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 more children. And also after the Second World War, there was an extension in the, in the expected years of living. So that uh, brought us to a peak in the dependency ratio uh, and uh, in the in the in the decade uh, between 60s and the 70s, but after that we have seen a bonanza in that sense, uh, because uh, fertility rates started to decline all over the world, in countries like China, in countries like India, in, in, even in countries also East Asia and the Pacific, not so much yet on on Africa, but but also getting there to the point that we are here today, what we call the era of stability. We are in a very good situation. We still have a few dependents as compared to the working age population. So, and this is basically what we may be feeling not so pressed to look at this as a threat. But soon after, you will start entering, as you see, the, depending on the different trajectories and simulations, into an era of increased dependency, and mostly explained by, again, decline of fertility on the countries that have not declined yet. And many countries are getting below the replacement rate. And uh, more importantly, as well, the patterns of aging. So the extend, the extended, uh, uh, the extension of the of the of the years of of living, which is a good thing. No, it's you actually all we all want to live more years, but this is going to create a challenge in the in the economies, especially those who are going to be uh, facing uh, what we call uh, you are getting getting older before getting rich. No, in that sense. In the past, countries that were getting older, like Japan and Korea, managed to get, be rich before. But we are entering into, into a situation, many countries, especially upper middle income countries, that are going to get much older before getting rich. This is another way to show the why I'm spending this is becoming a, you may think, a demographic uh, a course, but it's basically because we think that this is going to define the future patterns. This is basically the two groups of countries and looking at specific examples. The big shift you see is uh, it's not so much news that Western Europe is aging and the population population pyramid. Today you have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, much much skewed towards the elderly, and it's going to get even worse in by 2050. But the big the big news is going to be what happened to countries like Mexico. So you still have seen some shape still of a pyramid in 2022, but the Mexico will look like Europe today by 2050. Uh, and again, Mexico is just an example of many other countries. And I will place also Philippines in that trajectory. It's still not as extreme as Mexico, but you will get soon into that situation. Uh, but this is a country of, of the countries that are basically providing the majority of the migrants today, Latin American countries, Northern Africa, uh, countries in the, in, the, in the EAP region, uh, they're going to be in that situation. On the contrary, you have still youth population coming from the continents like Africa. And as you know, you have seen, a, it was a recent New York Times article that talks that by 2050, 35% of the working age population are going to come from South Saharan Africa. Uh, so this is the only continent that will be growing rapidly. And the problem we have uh, is that they are largely unskilled or very low skilled. So uh, in order to replace the workers that are going to be retiring soon in the higher income countries or upper middle income countries, there has to be a big discussion about uh, upskilling. Uh, and again, this is, this is within a country. In every country, you also have large population that are relatively unskilled, including here in the Philippines. 
So the question is, if you want to make them uh, uh, be brought productively in the labor market, we need to significantly invest in skills all over the place. Another way to show the same, this is a projection that we are doing uh, for uh, for different countries by taking into, we call it worker shortages. The way we do this is basically take today the uh, dependency uh, ratio in, so the working over dependent, the opposite of what I showed before uh, in the in the United States, you have 2.5 workers per uh, dependent. Um, so this is kind of the, the situation that you want to, to, to have. I mean, ideally, you, we don't say the U.S. is a perfect country in that sense, but we have to have a parameter. So if I take that projection and I pull all the way to 2050, you basically say just to maintain that dependency ratio, we these countries, the high income countries, will have to incorporate those many workers in the economy. So Japan is the most extreme. They need basically 45 million workers in the next 20 years just to maintain that specific uh, dependency ratio. Uh, followed by US, Italy, Spain, Germany. Um, we did also different simulations. There are policies that the, the countries can have. Um, basically, they can extend the age of retirement. So that's one way to maintain more workers in the economy. They can stimulate female labor for participation. In many countries, still female labor for participation is low. Um, but still, you know, uh, the, uh, it's still after taking into account all these factors. The reality is that they are not going to be able to cover all these gaps. They will need a lot of mig more of migrants. On the other hand, you have countries that the middle income countries that I was mentioning before, some of them will be, uh, according to this measure, still able to provide workers to the world. So these are all the countries that have, in a way, negative. So the, you, you have to read that Pakistan, for instance, could still uh, export 80 million workers and still have a decent uh, dependency ratio. No? Um, and even Philippines, in these estimates, you know, can, can also be even as up to uh, 30 million. You still will be in a, in a, in a relatively good shape. No? Assuming, of course, that those, those who stay are productive and working as they should, no? but this is an exercise that we need to do. But you see, of course, the situation that I was mentioning before, countries like Thailand, Brazil, Turkey, uh, Morocco, Colombia, Mexico, actually, they won't be able to, to export any more workers. They actually will need to absorb new workers. Okay. Next. And the challenge we have is, is not just a matter of quantity, but it's a matter of quality. Uh, the problem is we need workers that are productive, they can they have the right skills, and that they can be productive at destination. And the big challenge the world has, and that's why we are worried as an institution, global institution, as the World Bank, is how we're going to manage to upskill and help us skill the, work, the, the countries that will provide the workers in the future. Uh, the current trajectories are not that promising. Uh, the world has seen, uh, according to the, again, the different classification, high income, upper middle income, low income, and, and low, uh, lower, lower middle income. Uh, one success story, which is uh, primary school enrollment, is pretty much universal today, everywhere in the world. Uh, even in, in many countries in Africa has managed to enroll a lot of people. I mean, quality, of course, of education is another factor. And, and of course, there are a lot of issues with quality in many countries in the world, but at least we managed to put kids in primary school, and most of them are completing the primary education. The problem is secondary education, and it's even worse in tertiary education. The only regions that would manage to cap to catch up to decent uh, levels are the uh, upper middle income countries. Um, so in the Philippines, you also are in, in that category. You you have a, a significant share of secondary enrollment, but when you when you compare to low middle income and low income again the countries that are going to be supplying the future of the work the future workers you see only 60% of the kids are enrolled today in secondary education and in the low income countries only 40% so it's a huge massive uh, large number of people that are not getting access to even secondary education so that is worrisome that is a problem that we have collectively to solve and uh, and that's basically why we think this agenda is going to grow in importance. Um, among those who are still migrating, there are other concerns, and this is our valid concern. This is the typical brain drain uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, we are, we are many countries, and we, many counterparts we talk, they are saying, 
we are fine to let people migrate, but basically the most talented are leaving our countries and, and those we are depleting the capacity, the productive capacity locally. And they, they have a point, and this is a very valid concern. This is basically showing that the the share of the of the migrants, no, the the, the share of the the, the, the education level um, for for those who are migrants, it tends to be higher than the education levels of those nationals that is, that stay in the country. And this is pretty much across the board. This is uh, this is looking at tertiary education, the percentage of tertiary education. Uh, that had tertiary education among the migrants is much higher than the percentage that stay of nationals that have uh, that, that that have tertiary education. Um, I mean, this is this this could be a concern, especially if this is is this this look in a situation of uh, a static situation, no? The situation today. What are we arguing in the report is basically that this can also increase incentives to human capital in in the origin as well. So the, the prospective of getting the opportunity to migrate is bringing many, many people to get tertiary education and secondary education. So that can also create, be seen in the, in the opposite way, be seen as a positive development because it's basically creating a virtuous cycle of, of, of education and, and, and mobility. And again, this is an example we like to use. I'm not sure if you are familiar with this paper that came recently in the review of yeah, the so Economics and Statistics by one of your fellow Filipinos, Paolo Bacar, and another Caroline Th uh, Theodides, that look at the migration of Filipino nurses to the US. And basically, the graph of the left, which is interesting, is showing that when the US started to ease visa restrictions or basically locate more, more uh, vacancies to Filipino nurses, uh, not surprisingly, the, the, you, know, you see a peak in the number of uh, of Filipino nurses going to the U.S. This was happened uh, in one specific year in 2000, between 20, uh, 2020, 2004 and 2006. Uh, after that, the restrictions came back again. And you see, of course, the decline late after us on the, on the migration. Then it started to grow again. Uh, it, it evolves according to the, the spots available to bring uh, Filipino nurses. But this is creating, and you see the graph in the, in the right, and that's also the, the interesting uh, um, result they show, how the number of uh, students are enrolling in nursing uh, in those years as well. So basically, it seems that there is a high correlation between the probability to migrate to the US and the number of uh, students that are enrolling in nursing. So they come up with this specific statistic that says that for every uh, nurse that goes to the US, uh, as migrant, actually nine new students are enrolling in nursing. Um, so, so basically, that comes to the to the story that you know the the perspective of the probability of migrating is increasing our human our human capital at home. Right. Um, the same situation was registered in another paper in uh, in India with IT professionals. Again, the same story. There is a change in the H one B cap uh, visa. That's the visa that goes for high skill professionals in the US. So they allocated more, uh, more uh, 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 numbers no? for that visa, especially for, for IT professionals. That's the graph in the, in the left, in the graph in the middle, that increase the probability of migration for those uh, and the wage expected uh, for those IT professionals in India. And in turn, in the graph, in the graph of, the, of the right is showing that uh, what this has generated is two effects. One is an increase in the in the number of people enrolling in, in in IT degrees in India, and at the same time also the number of uh, new institutions, the new courses that have been open to 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 study for for IT. And you know the story now. I, uh, India is a is a country that has started, of course, supporting IT professionals. Now most of these shops are actually at home, and they are exporting services instead of people. They still piss poor people, but they also services. So that is creating also a positive effect in the sector. The concerns that, that some countries have, especially in uh, destination countries, is that okay, you you I mean that's what we are being told. No, you you are telling us that migration is is needed. We will have, of course, more workers that need to cover a lot of labor shortages in many sectors, but that also may generate impact in the in the in our own population and and it's true there is some concern about that uh, there are many studies that have looked at the impact of 
migration on low skilled workers and high skilled workers, native workers. Uh, the evidence is mixed specifically on low, on low skilled workers. There are countries where uh, is still migration is complementary to uh, workers, low skilled workers in, in destination, and that actually generate positive benefits. But in many others, the reality is that they also they also get impacted. Um, and of course, the discussion there is not to close the border for this for these countries, but actually, uh, I mean, there's a whole, whole debate on the U.S. on this. Of course, many 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 researchers uh, discussing the pros and cons of migration. It's a very hot political debate. But how we can compensate if anything those workers are going to lose. The, on the other hand, when we took a look at the impact of migration on high skilled workers, actually this is much more complementary. If anything, migrants are helping. Uh, uh, cover services that can now are now also lower cost for those high skilled immigrants and so sorry and sorry for high skilled natives and that is in the end generates a compensatory effect that is positive for those high skilled workers uh, at home. The other effect we need to take into account when we look at mobility is the the roles of uh, documented versus undocumented uh, migrants and again one of the things that we we keep uh, we keep saying in the in the in the reports that we write about this is basically one of the worst things you can do is to to uh, close uh, pathways for legal migration because the only thing is going to generate is that the incentives for migration will increase and uh, again this is another famous uh, graph and paper that uh, from Michael Clements one of the lead researchers sorry are you okay? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. That show the, the famous, I don't know, for those who are uh, in this literature, is a famous Bracero program. Basically, it was a temporary, a temporary um, agreement between Mexico and the U.S. to provide agriculture workers, uh, in, especially in California and, uh, and the southern states in, in the U.S. And in the 60s, they were uh, annually, they were absorbing about 500 million of uh, 500,000 of these workers every year. And suddenly in 1965, they decided to uh, close the program. It was one of the decisions of President uh, uh, Kennedy and then uh, Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Johnson at the time. And you know we think that it was a really bad idea because the only thing that generated, and you see the line that it, it spikes almost at the same level as the previous numbers, is the, the rise in undocumented migration from Mexico, even to the same levels of 400, 500,000 per year. So the employers were still employing uh, Mexicans uh, in the agriculture sector, but instead of doing the right way legally and with benefits and, and protection, they did the opposite way, no? Illeg illeg illegally and documented. And of course, these workers lack the protection that, that they need. So um, this is all conducting us to the match and motive framework. And this is a, the framework that in the World Development Report, we, we, we build basically to try to understand and guide the policy directions. Um, so basically what we want to, to look at when we look at migration is whether the migrants are a good match or not for the society in which they will going to, to land. So we, we saw that in general, these countries will need migrants. They will have a lot of shortages that to cover. But on the other hand, we also saw that there are some costs associated, no? costs associated to, to those workers in the origin, in the destination countries that are going to lose because now they have more competition from migrants. There are also social costs of integration that we need to take into account. And, and so what we needed to understand is if costs exceed benefits or benefits exceed costs. And uh, as much as possible, try to move more people into the category where benefits exceed costs. Okay. The one way to do that is, of course, bringing migrants that are a good fit for our labor market at destination. And that's the, the whole policies that try to attempt that are going to be uh, in essentially trying to move uh, uh, migrants from the lower box to the upper box. On the other hand, we need to understand the motive why people migrate. I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of people are migrating, most, most of them actually for economic reasons. Some of them are also mi migrating out of necessity, or what we call desperate migration. Or, uh, or even for fear to, of their life, uh, in the case of refugees and as, asylum seekers. Um, and again, um, we need to try to see as much as possible how we can minimize that box in the in the right. No, this is what we don't want: is uh, people to migrate for desperation. 
and also support the communities where they're going. In the case of those communities where they're receiving refugees, in many in many cases, many many are many in, in many parts of the world, they are not prepared to host some of these refugees. So uh, they also need support. On the other hand, opportunity at destination is basically we just need to be sure that when people move, they have uh, access to to the rights that uh, the the they are they're entitled to, uh, international protection, and also again. Uh, the possibility to to migrate uh, in a documented and legal way and not an undocumented. When you put everything together, basically the match and motive, you have like, uh, again, the, the upper quadrant is where we want to move as many people as possible. Uh, the people that are a stronger match at destination and are also migrating for an opportunity. And, and we want as much as possible to, to minimize the the lower quadrants. There are refugees, some of them that also have high skills uh, in, in the demand of destination. And my colleague Chagar usually used the example of Albert Einstein, who was one of he was a refugee in the uh, in the in, in the in the first half of the of the 20th century with high level of skills that were very useful for for the US when the and, uh, and uh, when when he we had the chance to migrate. Uh, there are a few of these cases, unfortunately, and sometimes they were not refugees, not even allowed to work in some of the countries where they work. So it's a waste of potential. But in general, the idea is we want to move as many people as the to the man, in many economic migrant squad. No? And one way to do that is to strengthen what we call bilateral alternative agreements. Again, it's not just moving people, but also discussing about how they are going to be a good match. And that implies also discussing about skills development, as I mentioned. Um, this is basically repeating the, 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 the main policy measures of the World Development Report. But basically the idea is, I want to concentrate you in the, in the left panel, is I talk about higher income countries that are rapidly aging. I talk about upper middle income countries that are entering to that stage as well, declining the fertility rates and starting to age. And I talk about low income countries that are have growth population, but Basically, they have high uh, uh, um, level of unemployment, underemployment, and lowest level of skills. Overall, this points out to the discussion that, that, that I trying to drive you today, which is basically we have significant skill shortages in countries of all income level, and we need to discuss about how to develop that. Okay, The right policies will bring benefits at origin and destination, benefit at origin in terms of remittances, in terms of skills uh, um, uh, development process when they when these migrants come home and bring ideas, bring businesses. Um, a destination, of course, the the attraction is that they can uh, fill the gaps they have in their labor market, uh, where in, in in sectors where there is high level demand. And of course, we want all the policies to be the right ones in terms of protection of migrants. We want uh, 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 countries to, of course, to, to embrace migration in, in their national development strategies. We want to also overcome and bring the discussion to economic terms instead of political hurdles, uh, discrimination, xenophobia that unfortunately still predominates in many countries. And essentially, we are trying to, to basically see that international labor mobility can be an opportunity, at the way, if we manage to tackle these three broader objectives, no? or investing in human capital. As again, there are global labor shortages and, 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 and skills needs that need to be developed, build international labor market intermediation systems. And this is something where the Philippines in particular can teach the world a lot, which is basically how we can align institutions, how we can make sure that, that, that we facilitate that movement, and how we can engage productively with our countries in terms of bilateral agreements um, and, and partnerships, no? which is the, 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 the last focus. No? Is, uh, is basically how we can not only uh, promote uh, mobility and but also share with the rest of the world the knowledge and best practices. The, the way to do this through bilateral and training agreements is basically the bilateral migration and training agreements is basically working on these two levels, no? And on building legal pathways, building opportunity for people to migrate in the, in the best way possible with protection and legal status, but at the same time, rich agreements of, of, of how we can develop these trainings that at the end of the day is going to benefit both origin countries and destination countries. 
And essentially, we are talking about a model that uh, is not new. It has been already uh, in place for a while. The concept of global skill partnerships actually was coined by the Center for Global Development in, 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 in Washington 15 years ago by scholars like Michael Clements that have been spreading this idea. What we are seeing now is the action is, 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 is coming into place. But basically, what you want to, the idea is basically, we want to uh, avoid the situation on the left where we have a pool of uh, skilled workers and we are just transferring one uh, skilled worker to destination. That is something that will, will of course, benefit a lot, the high, the high income countries where they are going, but it's depleting the uh, capacity of the origin country. So basically, instead of being a win-win, it's a only win-lose model. In the global skill partnership model, you allowing this person to migrate, but at the same time, you are creating the column in the middle, which is uh, fostering more people to acquire skills. No, the, the example I was mentioning before it was for the Filipino nurses. For everyone that migrates, actually nine of them are enrolling in, 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 in nursing school. And those graduates, some of them will stay, some of them will leave. But in the end, totally, I'm increasing the pool of skilled workers and allowing them to move and allowing them to, to develop and, and be productive both at home and at destination. The Global Skill Partnership Model tries to create that in a way that basically is done in coordination between the destinations and, and, and origin countries. And because there are shared benefits, there also implies shared responsibilities. And uh, what we're trying to promote is basically agreements between countries in which the country of destination also collaborates in the skill development process. Uh, it collaborates with uh, expertise. One of the main factors that prevents sometimes uh, productive movement is, for instance, skill recognition. So uh, a person may get a degree in the Philippines that is not recognized abroad. Uh, and so that uh, actually can generate a situation just not of brain drain, but also brain waste. The person may even end up working in, in driving an Uber when they have a medical degree because the medical degree is not being recognized at destination. Um, so that's one of the aspects that we want to this scheme to discuss. We want also, of course, uh, transfer expertise, um, transfer financing. Um, at the end of the day, it's much cheaper to train a worker in, in low-income countries than in high-income countries if we have the higher standards. Uh, there was a calculation done in, uh, for the corridor between Germany and some of the uh, Morocco, one of the countries that were providing uh, professionals, and it costed three times more to train that person in Germany than in Morocco. So there is a benefit that companies and, and governments of destination are having. So some of these benefits may be shared with the origin countries to help uh, increase the pool of skilled workers. So that way we are moving into, a, instead of win-lose win situation, into win-win situation, okay? And there are examples that I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the mic to uh, my colleague Limon, who you, you may introduce yourself as well. And he has been uh, studying this extensively, his dissertation. So uh, Limon will, will guide us now, and then I come back again to finish the presentation. Thank you, Pablo. First and foremost, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Beta, Dr. Um, Domingo, um, Kimba, and maybe for helping make this event possible. So to continue what uh, what Pablo indicated. So we have various labor mobility schemes, and we've identified or we've, we've analyzed that some of these schemes target certain sectors or are more suitable for, cert for certain skill levels. So, for example, for low-skilled workers, for instance, in sectors such as agriculture, circular migration type of schemes no, are, are, are a good fit. So we have examples from the Pacific, for, exa for example, the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility or Palm Scheme, which is a merger of the short-term and the medium-term temporary schemes no, in, uh, in Australia and the Pacific. You have the Seasonal Worker Program, SWP, short-term scheme and the medium-term scheme, which runs for one to th three to four years, which is the Pacific Labor Facility Scheme or Pacific Labor Scheme or PLS. You have the recognized seasonal employer scheme between New Zealand and the Pacific um, Island countries and the EPS no, by the government of South Korea. And I'll talk about you know the EPS scheme uh, in, in a detail in a bit. And we think you know that you know the global skills partnerships or the GSPs, you know, uh, 
their sweet spot will be in the in, in the middle skill or the medium skilled sectors no for for medium uh, skilled workers in particular for example for example in construction trade hospitality etc and we have examples in the region uh, that are you know uh, de facto examples of and the de facto examples of GSPs no we have the Australia Pacific Training Coalition and as Pablo indicated so one of the th three must have features no, of, of GSPs are first, you know, it meets skill shortages. It trains for skill shortages in both the origin and destination countries. Second, it is funded, no? Training is funded by the destination. And third, it must occur through a regular or a legal migration pathway. So these GSPs no, meet these three conditions. We have PAM, which is a, a global skilled partner between Vietnam and Germany in the metal processing sector, which I will be talking about in a bit. And that's a good example of skill recognition and the specified skilled workers no, in Japan, no, which is a response to some of the challenges experienced in their technical intern training program or TITP. Yes. And we also have the, uh, the GSP between the Philippines and uh, Vietnam no, in the nursing sector. And for the high skilled sectors, for example, uh, we have information communications technology. We have examples from the GIZ, no? uh, the triple win program in the nursing sector, which in fact involves Germany and other countries, no? uh, other uh, rather other sending countries, such as Tunisia, Kerala in India, Indonesia, Philippines. And as you may know, Singapore has you know certain visa categories for certain skill levels. So for high skilled workers, they have the employment pass, and for other skill levels, they have the S pass, uh, and you know you have they have, they have they have their work permits. And recently, you no know, Japan has introduced uh, visa categories you no know, for 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 high skilled workers, such as the J skip. So just to give you like a flavor you know, of the examples of GSPs that uh, we have studied. So as I mentioned, so we have APTC, no, as uh, the largest, no, a stand, a largest example, no, of a of a GSP. So since uh, its founding, no, um, it has over twenty thousand graduates, no, full qualifications grad, full qualification graduates. So in terms of like, no, the the, the three must have features that I've specified. So it meets, no, the skill shortages, no, both in the Pacific Island countries and in Australia. So these are like the sectors that they hone in on auto repair, manufacturing, construction, utilities, tourism, hospitality, health, and community services. It's funded by the Department of Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or DFAT. And you know, it uh, it is it occurs through a regular migration channel. Although I must say that uh, an area for improve a key area for improvement is to improve alignment you now with existing Australian visa programs. But with the introduction of the Palm scheme, it will, you know integrate no um aptc no will will have like will need to align no with this with this uh with 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 the with the with the with the visa categories to make sure that they are um aligned no uh with the uh with the uh australia visa program so with the introduction of the, the palm scheme which seeks to reintegrate seeks to con uh integrate no the, the the combine the different visa categories and there's also this specific engagement visa for 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 higher skilled workers and we also have examples from outside of the region. No? So we have examples on Palim, which is like focusing on ICE sector between Morocco and Belgium, and the Tham project. No? In particular, there's this Belgian component no, of the Tham project between Belgium, Tunisia, and um, what do you call this, and, um, and, on, and Morocco. So as I mentioned, APTC is our biggest example no, of GSP, no? and it's coming from our region, no? East Asia and Pacific. So since its founding, so over 20,000 full qualification graduates. And what can we learn from APTC? I think one of the key features or key lessons that we've learned from APTC is in order to reach the scale, no, uh, it was able to develop no, the, uh, the institutional capacity, in particular in TVET, no, Technical Education, Education and Training. So they've worked closely with the TVET providers in the Pacific. So they have this partnership frameworks with various TVET providers in the region, for instance, in terms of TVET teacher capability development, in terms of better alignment with the labor market needs, and for instance, in terms of upgrading facilities and, and, and equipment. So that's one of the 
success factors no of uh, of uh, APTC and in terms of cost reduction and cost sharing or shared responsibility in uh, in 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 uh, in, uh, in 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 terms of costs so given that they've reached that scale right so it has occurred owing in part to say economies of scale so in the beginning in in pilots you incur up significant upfront investments. You invest in infrastructure, invest in technology. But over time, after you've incurred, you know, uh, you know, uh, your 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 fixed costs, right? Uh, the, the marginal costs, you know, will diminish over time, and that's what's happening, you know, uh, with with their cost per graduate. You no, know? uh, it was from I think nearly eight, twenty thousand Australian dollars to about less than 15,000 no or, or close to 10,000 no Australian dollars no uh, more recently no using the data that they provided us and of course there's this as, a, as i mentioned the, the the cost sharing or the shared responsibility in costs so it's not just like dfat no while dfat primarily funds or no, finances the training there is an increasing role for other providers for other stakeholders to to share in the costs no of uh, of uh, of uh, of the program so for instance Pacific employers, Pacific industry associations, um, you know, Pacific governments are pitching in, no? and that will help to reduce the training cost per graduate. And of course, the other bit is the nationalization of staff. Previously, they were hiring international trainers no, in the Pacific Islands, so that basically um, helped to drive up the costs. But with uh, with 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 training local trainers, with with uh, and some of them came from APTC themselves. You know that helped to reduce no the, the the training cost per graduate. And I was mentioning EPS. I think I just want to highlight here three three things. First, prior to the introduction of the employment permit system in South Korea, there was a large role for labor market intermediaries, and several of them charged high recruitment fees no for the migrant workers, and that was the impetus for the introduction of the uh, employment permit system or EPS. So it is a G two G government to government program, and that removed no, the role of the uh, in labor market intermediary. So you would notice that you know the 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 the, the, the recruitment fees no uh, paid no by my market workers uh, became minimal no if not non existent no um, after the introduction of this program. And the second, it doesn't end no the the the, the scaling no doesn't end or the 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 the, the, the my, it, it there is a value add no in the program in that. Once they are in South Korea, there's an opportunity to upskill. So the, the government of South Korea works with vocational institutes in the country to upgrade no, the, the skills no, of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, migrant workers. No, and most of these workers, I think all of the all of these workers are from the neighboring countries in the region, from Asia and the Pacific. And the third bit is, since it's a, it's targeting prim primarily low skilled workers, once they return, there they have this happy return program. So they 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 provide you know um, entrepreneurship opportunities, not training. So they could they could take on entrepreneurship opportunities when they reach back home. So this I think the three uh, you know activities or three three success factors of this EPS program. And you know just wanna you know uh, I will not drain this slide, but I just su su suffice it to say that there's still areas for improvement in terms of. Placing no the workers to like you know high growth sectors and improving the match you know uh, from from the worker perspective and simplifying you no know, the application process you no know, the administrative process and yeah I think you're very well aware of this you know recently you no know, the different agencies that are in charge of migration in the Philippines have been merged into the Department of Migrant Workers just last Friday you no know, Pablo Chalar and the rest of the team you no. Know, uh, Met you know with uh you know high level government officials uh, at DMW to talk about you know the, uh, the 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 migration experience and ways we could we could take the migration agenda forward and building blocks of global skills partnerships it's important to have these you no know, the these components you no know, you have the legal and regulatory frameworks because that will increase predictability you no know, of, of 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 these scheme of these scheme schemes. It's just a coordination, so it's not just like the Department of Migrant Workers. They also collaborate, would say, with the Department of Foreign Affairs. You have to collaborate with, uh, you know, other relevant agencies, and ministries. For example, Department of Health for nurses, or Department of Education, or the Technical and Vocational Education Training Authority, and institutional capacity. 
because if you want to reach the scale no, of, uh, of, of, of sending no, 20,000 workers or so, or tens of thousands of workers, not just abroad, for, for, for employment abroad, but also domestically, we, all, we need not to, to improve not the institutional capacity, say, in labor market intermediation, in TVET capacity, in the diaspora engagement. And in fact, like the Palim no, example that I was telling you about in Morocco and Belgium, the example of uh, institutional capacity development. So we had the World Bank project on tourism sector between Germany and Morocco. We have this Palim project between Belgium and Morocco in the ICT sector. And there are other projects, say, you know, the circular migration between Morocco and Spain, and they've leveraged the public employment service and APEC no, to do the labor market intermediation role. So they work closely with the employers, you know, as a labor market intermediary. They work, you know, they 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 screen the CVs, you know, and they they advertise the job openings, you know, they 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 coordinate with the training providers in terms of you know the training provision and they they interview, you know, they participate you know, in, in the interviews, you know, with uh with 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 the uh, interviews with 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 the participants, with with the applicants and and, and they play a role in the selection of the participants. So that's an example no, of, uh, of, of, of uh, developing the institutional capacity of participants. Skill recognition, I told you about PAM, no, between Morocco and uh, between Vietnam and Germany, rather. So in that example, they've modified an existing two-year vocational program in plastic processing and align it with the Vietnamese curricula and with the German qualification standards, such, such, such that after no um you know the, the the participants completed the program they will go through no formal recognition it's more of a formal because like they are basically aligned no uh they're basically aligned with the, with the programs in with the, with the, with the qualification standards in germany so they will just have to go through like you know a, a, a formal recognition program and that will, uh, enables no skills recognition so that, that's one of the advantages of gsp it embeds no um skill recognition by design financial sustainability um, the, uh, one example no, is the specified comes from the specified skilled worker program in uh, in Japan. Onodera User Training is a firm, a Japanese firm that shoulders no, the training no, in the sending countries, and the selected participants no, who will be deployed for it to Japan for for work under the seasonal uh, the specified skilled worker program or SW. The additional training that will happen in Japan will be shouldered by the employers in in Japan. So that's an example of. Um, financial sustainability and in fact shared and and, and more than that no a shared responsibility in uh, in, in financing welfare protection um uh, with the uh, introduction of palm scheme which i told you about uh there are measures no, to improve welfare protection and social integration another example is the palm scheme so as part of their training they are uh in introducing no uh, or they have included no integration aspects no, in the uh in the uh, in the in the in the training of the of the of the Moroccans who are working in uh, who will be working or will be deployed in Belgium and once in Belgium there are centers you know, that will help them to you know um, integrate into the local community in the in the Flanders region you know, in in the country. And I promise I'm gonna be brief because I know we are way over time. <laughs> um, I want to of course to to say I'm curious to hear the reactions from the audience especially uh, on the and how the Philippines is handling this. From the outside, we are very admirers that you managed to create an ecosystem of institutions and agreements with the rest of the world, including even the creation of the Department of Migrant Welfare, which is kind, kind of unique uh, when you look at uh, other countries. It's a, it's a big innovation. But I want to, of course, hear from you. You are the experts in the country. Uh, from outside, we all tell uh, countries that they should try to go to where Philippines is. But uh, but you know, I know when when you, when they talk about internally, people have also the other other perspectives. Um, what we are trying to do, just to conclude, is as a World Bank trying to promote most of the global skill partnerships. As we as I mentioned from the beginning, that is, we are very concerned about the global shortages of skills and where the workers are going to come in the future and how we can start preparing the systems in those countries. No, to also get agreements as well with with many potential destinations. And we are seeing, of course, initial traction in many countries in the in the world. Um, for instance, we are promoting, a, we have a project on promoting GSP between Spain and three Latin American countries, Colombia, Ecuador, and Dominican Republic. Naturally, many of these GSPs are going to emerge in countries that can cultural affinity. Language is a big barrier. In this case, of course, Spain uh, speaks Spanish, like the Latin American countries. 
Philippines, you have it easy because you speak English. And many countries are, are okay with getting workers who speak English, but uh, in others, it's proven complicated, no? like Japan, Korea, the worker will need to, to learn the language first. Um, what we're doing in this type of projects is helping the country select the sectors with a skill gap that can be uh, beneficial at both destination and origin, uh, working into designing those training programs, creating this skills matching tool that will, well, at the end of the day, help link the supply and demand, um, and capacity building to institutions involved, the legal framework that needs to be in place, and also aspects of statistical capacity, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, this requires, of course, exchanging information and tracking the workers all, all the way, and, and, and that is something that uh, even I, I learned from the Philippines now, innovations on that front, including mobile app, that the, the migrants will have, so that the migrant Department of Migrant Welfare will also have real-time information on the situation of migrants abroad. Uh, and yeah, I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you. And I look forward to comments. Yeah, and we have raised two of our uh, uh, fellows to have a formal comment before we have the... Uh, one is uh, Dr. Tabuga has been working on migration for us as we can first and there's unfortunately the other one cannot be here at this time because of the short notice so he act, but he actually recorded a comment uh that yeah so you can start with dr kabuga first thank you dr bates um i'd like to thank dr acosta and mr rodriguez for and congratulate congratulations for the presentation um, it's my pleasure to be able to share my comments um, on this topic. So the Global Skills Partnership is a win-win strategy for addressing global shocks and imbalances through migration. This is done by ensuring that skills are matched with demand with careful consideration of important issues like brain drain. So um, Dr. Acosta and his colleague shared various examples of bilateral training and migration agreements. And these are basically um, agreements between origin and destination countries on the training and migration of workers in specific skills and sectors to ensure mutual gains. There are two elements of the agreement um, I noted, migration through legal labor pathway, existing or new, and mutual agreement on training and vocational focus. Sorry, I'm referring to the, the previous PowerPoint presentation that was provided. And these agreements are important because of the clear need for coordination, because that's what partnerships um, is about. And these are in aspects of intermediation, skills training, supporting migrant welfare, and gathering information, gathering and storing information. Apart from coordination, there has to be enforcement that guarantees ethical recruitment, safe and orderly migration, fair working conditions, and reduced undocumented migration. The important uh, aspect of the design of the GSP is the skills training to meet labor demands in both countries, destination and origin. In the training program, there is home and away track. Those trained under the home track are aimed at fulfilling the labor needs of the origin, while those in the away track are meant for addressing the labor needs of the destination country. This skills training is a shared responsibility of all stakeholders, and labor mobility is facilitated through more agile and legal pathways. It's a win-win strategy. Skills development is crucial because um, more skilled and more educated migrant workers are more likely to succeed in their migration journey than low-skilled ones. They receive higher remuneration, enjoy better work conditions, have higher access to social protection, they're less vulnerable to various kinds of migration-related problems. They're also less reliant on their social networks, which means that they can better take care of themselves and exercise greater agency and autonomy in the decision-making process. With improved skills, migrant workers tend to have wider options and better access to local and foreign labor markets. Therefore, programs aim at improving their skills and education are essential and beneficial in the long term. But GSP isn't just skills training program. It is one that is targeted for specific labor demands where the partnerships promote cost sharing, as mentioned earlier, and guarantee more efficient and safe migration pathways. So um, I actually got curious. Um, I want to know why the Philippines is not part of the GSP. And I did some um, web research. And I found out that we have one with Germany. Um, interestingly, there are currently two universities 
Baliwag University and the Philippine Northwestern University, which are in partnership with the German Development Agency, GIZ. And the sector, you might guess, is nursing. There is also a German university that is involved. Um, this GSP in the Philippines started in September 2020. So by now, I think they, they might have some process evaluations that we can use. And um, the aim of the GSP um, between Philippines and Germany is to provide nursing students with special training so that nurses can more easily qualify for nursing jobs in both countries, Germany and the Philippines. The training integrates content of the German nursing training with the Philippine nursing training program. Other administrative matters like visa and the movement itself is being taken care of through the partnership. GIZ facilitates the application process for recognition of the nurses' professional qualifications in Germany. Um, unfortunately, there isn't much information about how the program is being implemented, although maybe some um, government representatives who are attending today may have more detailed information, um, and I think it would be useful to get them. But I would like to include it as one of the bases for my discussion. I thought that um, we might be able to we might be able to relate more or it would be more thought-provoking to use it as an example alongside those already presented um, by uh, Dr. Acosta and Mr. Rodriguez. Um, the first question I'd like to make is about how the program is able to meet labor demands in the destination countries so far. Um, I think we have, um, we have uh, listened to the lessons learned, but it's interesting to know, um, perhaps for instance, the APTC, um, it's the largest um, and perhaps one of the first uh, to be implemented um, under the GSP framework. But it's it's interesting to see or to know how many of the 20,000 graduates have already or uh, have already successfully migrated, for instance, for work in Australia, and how many have found jobs um, in the local economies in the Pacific and other um, countries that are um, members or participants of the of the partnership. And this is important because to prevent brain drain, the GSP promises to address both labor demands in the host and origin countries. Um, with existing wide gaps in wages and economic development between the origin and destination countries, it's important to, to understand what mechanisms um, can be implemented that can be sustained to ensure that possible brain drain is prevented or at least reduced. Similarly, com contemplating on the Philippines GSP case, it would be important um, ex ante to think about how nursing, uh, how the nursing training program will turn out for those in the home track. So how many of these will get jobs as nurses in the local health system, knowing that we have very um, low wages in our, um, in our local um, hospitals, and, and how many of them will eventually decide to work abroad. Um, in the example of the PALIM, the pilot project addressing labor shortages through labor, through innovate, innovative labor migration between Morocco and Belgium, um, I'm interested to know what happens to the youth that have completed the course but were not, um, were, were not on track to be hired by the Belgian firms. Have they also found have they also found ICT related jobs in Morocco? Were there any challenges? Um, it's it's good to think about. Uh, think uh, of these questions, I think, um, because it's very important. My other inquiry is, is um, about the details of the implementation. I'm not sure whether um, it's already available, this, this kind of detailed information, but it would be helpful to think about whether, for instance, the, the, the other courses, the ICT and um, the other about metals, um, whether um, the elements of the of the training that came from the the, the destination country partner sort of uh, really went inside the main program so that in that it I was I was thinking that if for instance the German element of the program would be permanently included in the Philippine uh, in the nurse in local nursing program of the two universities that we we have right now is that it it would be open to students outside the program, like an optional course that, you know, they can enroll in and pay for because um, beyond the, the, the program timeline. But um, 
and if so, will the curriculum um, be regularly updated? Those those kinds of, of small details. I ask this because um, in this way, I think the program, the training program would have um, more important or more long lasting contribution in terms of improving the quality of the, the local curriculum. Um, and it can have a more sustained impact. Also, I think this has already been um, mentioned uh, by Mr. Rodriguez. I wonder if any of the GSPs presented has in their design um, close and concrete partnership with local stakeholders, particularly those uh, from the private sectors. The, these are the potential local employers um, who can employ the, the trained workers under the home track. And these local employers would certainly gain from a pool of um, more skilled workers that come out from the program, and they may even have uh, to put some investments in the program themselves. And um, so you've mentioned uh, the case of Japan, that they were able to do this, but to what extent is also, to what extent is this possible also for those in the lower, like lower income countries? So, um, it, because I've, I've seen from the APTC case that there is um, coordination with employers in the demand side, but but not on the supply side. Or perhaps it was not highlighted um, in, in the presentation. Um, I have some uh, more general thoughts about the issue of brain drain. Of course, um, we have to think of it, especially in the Philippines, in, in a more um, holistic way. Um, but yeah, I think um, the more important issue here is the, the G2G arrangements um, remain um, small in, in scale. And if we look at the Philippines case, G2Gs are, are done in very small proportion compared to the, the total deployment of more than 2 million um, people. So, But nevertheless, um, I, I personally welcome the idea of the GSP since, since many of our workers are already heavily invested um, in working abroad, we might as well train them well. And I think um, it's a good, it's a great framework, especially when it can be scaled up, you know, using mechanisms that have been tried and tested. And we look forward to more details um, about the GSP in your publication, your upcoming publication. And congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, we would like to hear the recorded uh, comment of one of our colleagues who cannot be here, uh, Dr. Rivera. Dr. Aniceto C. Orbeta Jr., President, Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Dr. Pablo Ariel Acosta, Lead Economist and Global Lead for Migration, World Bank. Dr. Audrey D. Tabuga, Fellow Discussant and Senior Research Fellow of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. And to our distinguished guests and audience, physically present at the PIDS Conference Hall, as well as participants joining via Zoom, a pleasant morning to everyone. Magandang umaga po. My sincerest apologies for not being able to physically join you this morning, Nonetheless, I thank PIDS for having me as one of the discussants to this thought-provoking study presented by Dr. Acosta earlier. My discussion emanates from previous studies I did on labor migration with multilateral and national organizations. The literature on labor migration has been very rich, particularly on the impacts of labor migration on the labor-sending and labor-receiving economies. Empirical evidence highlighted the distortions caused by migrations for both labor-sending and labor-receiving economies. That is why, it is of great importance and value and interest to find win-win migration outcomes, especially for developing economies who are most often the labor-sending economies. I subscribe to the rule of three, so I, I particularly chose top three thoughts I encountered during the presentation. And here are the top three key insights I gathered from the presentation earlier that I would like to elaborate in this discussion. First, migration happens due to either push or pull factors. There are significant costs involved, such as social, economic, and human costs. However, there are also significant benefits for both labor-receiving and labor-sending economies. Second, labor mobility will become a necessity in the decades to come for economies at all levels of income. Hence, we need to pay attention to the demographic transition the world is experiencing. Third, by focusing on skills development at origin, we can transform the risk of brain drain into brain gain, and potential migrants can be more competitive in the global job market. 
Given these three key insights, my discussion will augment the discourse and will revolve also on three key inputs to consider towards a win-win migration outcome with emphasis on the migration of professionals based on the experience of the Philippines. And in this case, the GSP is an opportune vehicle to foster a win-win situation for both labor sending and receiving economies as it captures skills recognition, financial sustainability, welfare protection, and social integration. First, I want to bring up a systemic view to labor migration from the lens of a developing economy like the Philippines. Second, I also want to look into the financing of the cost of education given the current situation and setup here in the Philippines. Third, it is also imperative to look into the financing of the social costs of labor migration, particularly for the sending economy. I see these three key inputs as pertinent to the discussion of coming up with a win-win migration outcome as the migration situation in most developing economies are anchored on these issues. I concur with the World Development Report that migration happens due to both push and pull factors. Coming from the lens of developing economies, it is indeed a push and pull factor primarily, primarily driven by motivations to migrate, moderated or mediated by wage differentials and the quality of working conditions in the sending economy vis-a-vis -vis the receiving economy. And we have seen this during the pandemic where in the Philippines experience uh, the migration of its healthcare professionals. It actually threatened uh, the healthcare situation in the country during the pandemic when it badly needs all the healthcare workers to respond to the pandemic. While this will augment healthcare sector of the receiving economy, it may be to the detriment of the sending economy. That's why this one calls for a win-win solution. Second, Dr. Acosta's presentation also mentioned that we need to pay attention to the demographic transition the world is experiencing because with global economic imbalances, diverging demographic trends, and climate change, labor mobility will become a necessity in the decades to come for countries at all levels of income. Again, coming from the lens of the less developed economies, the uneven economic growth among economies in the world, opportunities, to earn higher income for the same kind of work, notwithstanding opportunity costs of migration, opportunities from labor shortages and labor surpluses between and among economies that set labor value, which fuels labor migration across various demographic levels or demographic segments. I also concur with the need to put more attention to demographic transition, but I would like to emphasize the educational factor in asking practical questions to come up with this win-win migration outcome. Let's go to the three core elements of successful international labor mobility policies as emphasized in Dr. Acosta's presentation. This three-pronged approach to successful international labor mobility policies, namely investing in human capital, well-managed systematic international social protection and labor market intermediation system, and constructive global dialogue and partnerships. These are core elements that are critical in the development of a win-win solution. But I would like to focus on the first, which is in investing in human capital to enable country-level talent to be more competitive in the global job market. But in this case, a critical question must be addressed here or must be posed here. And that is, who should shoulder the cost of education or the cost of training? Related to this, with the lucrative opportunities abroad, the mission of higher education institutions or HEIs is somewhat altered towards the external demand and may not be necessarily for domestic employment. We need to clarify the trust of educational programs. And under a globalized environment, the relevance of programs in higher educational institutions should not only answer the human resource requirements of the various sectors of the economy, but also the requirements of the external environment. But in this light, instructional programs must be flexible and responsive to the expanding and changing needs of both the internal and external labor markets. However, specific skills training aimed for employability should be reviewed in the context of the dynamic changes in knowledge on one hand and the manpower requirements within and outside the economy on the other hand. What is needed is the provision of an educational experience that will make graduates trainable in the workplace and adjust to the rapid changes in both local and international labor market. And this is particularly relevant with the existence of mutual recognition arrangements in the ASEAN region, 
and perhaps in other regional trading blocks, where incomparability now of skills is very important to facilitate mobility from one economy to another. Now, zooming in on the investing in human capital, and I would like to take the case of education in the Philippines, wherein tertiary education is provided publicly and privately. There are public and private institutions of higher learning. And this has implications on financing higher education. With thousands of HEIs in the Philippines, there is now a pressure to establish and expand programs that will cater to the needs of the international labor market. Historically, the private sector in the field of education has been very responsive to changes in the external labor market. Recall there was a time wherein there was an increase in the nursing programs and computer-related programs, the emphasis on the English language, the proliferation of skills program on caregiving, legal transcription, medical transcription emerged when a time that there was a very high demand for these skills in the international labor market. An interesting implication here is on financing higher education. It can be argued that since the returns to tertiary education from external employment accrue to the individual, the individual should be the one to shoulder financing the cost of education. However, this is still on a case-to-case -case basis subject to debate. However, in the spirit of equity and political expediency, there is also a possibility of expanding educational programs included or including in state universities and colleges, private universities and colleges, to be geared towards external employment. There is the somewhat pressure to do that. And this will have implications on the basic education and the roles of state universities and colleges in particular. Because as more funds are reallocated towards public higher education, there's a trade-off. Funds for basic education may be substantially reduced. And given an increasing school age population, the quality and access to basic education is imperiled with such reallocation. But again, it would still depend on the magnitude of reallocation. This will also have a long-term bearing on the state of higher education in the Philippines. Because if basic education is weak because of low quality, it will produce ill-prepared graduates for vocational training and higher education. And the ability of these educational institutions to maintain the competitive edge of the Filipino labor is thus threatened in the future since the necessary ingredient for quality graduates and quality employees are not sufficient. Moreover, the potential disorientation of some HEIs towards instruction for employment rather than research and graduate education and socially relevant programs may further undermine the future productivity of Filipino workers in the global market. For example, future teachers in basic education, vocational education, and higher education may not be available and qualified to provide such services in higher educational institutions because of limitations in graduate programs. The lack of research in higher educational institutions may be detrimental to the creation of knowledge, to the creation of new ways of doing things that will further improve the way we deliver education. In the Philippines, most HEIs are geared towards research and publication so that we do not only teach based on what has been established before, but students are now given state-of-the-art education instruction that has been anchored on scientific research. From the human capital perspective, the possibility of overseas employment, as well as the high compensation to such employment opportunities, may in fact increase the rate of return to higher education. And for those who privately finance their education, the payback period would be faster. However, going back to the way programs, educational programs are designed and developed, such enhanced returns may not reflect the human resource requirements of the country. Thus, we can see here that the greater demand for education may not be consistent with the human resource needs of a developing economy like the Philippines because it competes with the demand for the international labor market. Worse, even if enhanced demand for higher education programs does reflect the manpower requirements of the domestic economy, the graduates from these expanded academic programs may not be attracted to work in the domestic economy or be part of local employment, but rather seek employment in the overseas market because of the wage differentials and disparity in work conditions. For example, the huge demand for nursing education in the Philippines is seen to answer more the growing needs for medical services in the developed economies. 
instead of responding more to the needs of the Philippines. And from the human resource development perspective, the enhanced demand for education in the country, given the high probability of migration, may be counterproductive since it may not respond to the human resource needs of the country. And under a globalized setting and increasing liberalization of trade and services, given this emerging larger regional trading blocks, the highly trained individuals from developing economies would be able to easily move to sectors where there are manpower deficiencies, particularly in developed economies. While those who are still gaining experience are left behind in the sending economies with a few authorities in the field to train them who chose to stay in the country. So for example, because of the huge demand for nurses globally, many of the qualified, well-trained, well-experienced nurses from the Philippines have migrated to the developed countries to take advantage of the lucrative opportunities, benefits that are awaiting for them in that area or in, in those countries. And we have seen this during the pandemic. Okay? Aside from increasing the training costs of those who are still gaining experience, the excessive outflow of medical professionals can threaten the viability and productivity of the local healthcare sector. Again, this has been evident during the pandemic. Okay. And it will continue to further constrain the healthcare sector that if another health crisis would happen, it would be problematic for the healthcare sector. While we recognize that not everyone chose to leave, the remaining capacity is not enough to address domestic needs. And it will simply just burn out those who chose to stay. They must be given sufficient runway a capacity to be able to fulfill their duty. The massive outflow of professionals has also created resource allocation effects. For example, by attracting doctors and other non-nursing health professionals to go back to school, to study a program, to take a program that would bring them opportunities to work abroad. It is still a possibility. And as the trained professionals migrate, the quality of services in the local economy may be affected. And in addition, the ability of the country, the ability of HEIs to produce, the replacement of these migrating professionals are also threatened. Okay? Because even instructors are moving out and more and more practitioners are transferring to the more lucrative profession. These have to be addressed. Okay? Now, the following factors may contribute to the realization of this issue. Number one, the loss of our trained professionals to the developed economies. And our local industries are left with mostly those who are still starting in their respective professional careers. Okay? And then we also lose, okay, lose our professionals because of shifting professions and the decline in enrollment. Because of the shift, because of the reallocation of resources towards the more lucrative ones. Although the educational sector may be responsive to the needs of the external market, again, I have emphasized earlier, that it may not be relevant to the domestic needs and the domestic sector is threatened. On the other hand, there's also a social cost to the exodus of graduates of HEIs to seek employment overseas. And the social cost of educating the manpower needs of the rest of the world have to be quantified. This is where the GSP would be inappropriate, would be appropriate to, to be looked into in order to quantify this manpower requirement. Likewise, in the higher education in the Philippines, there is also an enormous consideration that public funds have been used for education. And the exodus of those educated by public funds may entail a brain drain on the country's human resources. And in the light of the massive outflows of educated manpower, these flows have implications on the higher education sector as well as the other sector. Okay. For example, let me go back to my example on our medical professionals. The excessive migration of medical professionals is threatening not only the medical education in the country, but also the entire healthcare services sector. Now, since medical professionals could not be prevented from seeking employment overseas, the sectors that carry the burden should be compensated adequately to arrest the deterioration of education and the provision of services in the country. One of the main drawbacks of external migration is the phenomenon of brain drain, which has been mentioned in the presentation earlier. Brain drain occurs when the country loses its talented and skilled labor force and its ability to replenish those who leave the country is threatened. In a globalized setting, as the economy prepares 
local professionals for global competition, investment in human capital entail some social cost. The increase in the human capital value of professionals from these training and educational expenditures may push many of them to work overseas, which may lead to the problem of brain drain. As more employment opportunities abroad open, many local academics, professionals may opt to migrate. Okay? And the brain drain will certainly be harmful to the economy as other countries will reap the benefits of the education and training provided by the Philippine education system. Although on a positive side, it would also give opportunities for those people who have been left behind in the sending economy. Okay? That's why a systemic view of labor migration is very important so that we can weigh costs and benefits. And training, no? training the replacements will entail additional expenses with no assurance that these replacements will remain in the country. So what can be done? So these are some potential inputs for consideration towards a win-win migration outcome. So here, first, there is a need to further improve the management of temporary labor migration. The GSP is in the position to assist developing economies with this. Although the Philippines may have some of the best practices in the management of labor migration in terms of deployment, protection of workers, what is lacking is the mechanisms of addressing the potential impact of labor migration on education and other sectors in the long run. If the government cannot control migration flows and the propensity of people to seek external employment, there should be more investments, no? not only in education, but also on other human capital enhancing expenditures expenditures that will improve the social structures, would improve welfare. This will increase. Yes, this will increase the competitiveness of our workers in the global market, but it can also give them reasons to stay in the country. Okay, The global market no, is there, but there are also opportunities in the labor market. Managing labor migration must be a two-way street from the sending perspective vis-a-vis -vis the receiving perspective. There's also a need to address the negative consequences of labor migration and its impact on human resource development. I would like to raise the need to revisit the theoretical exit tax proposed by Baguati in 1976 towards greater equity aligned with modern times. We have to look into it, but with the lens of the modern times, factoring in greater equity and greater consideration for the different issues that migrant workers have been facing. And here, we can go back to the question of who made the investment in education. And why is this so? Because revenues generated from this approach can be redirected to fund the negative externalities and negative impacts of labor migration on the sending economy. It can even be directed towards the improvement of education and the industries that were displaced due to labor migration. Third, a challenge to the management of temporary labor migration is the redirection of its consequence, which is remittances, the redirection of remittances of, or remittance income towards income and employment generation, so it will temper excessive external migration and arrest negative consequences attached to it. There are opportunities abroad, but the local economy is also offering sufficient opportunities for those who will choose to stay. And on that note, thank you very much for your attention. May you have a fruitful discussion. I take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Acosta for a wonderful presentation, and I am excited to learn more about developments in our quest for a win-win migration outcome. Maraming salamat po, magandang umaga, at hanggang sa muli. Thank you, uh, JP. Now, we have one other question from Dr. Uh, uh, Toots Albert, who's also online, might be here today. Is Toots still around or Toots, are you still here? Or maybe just can read uh, who has uh, better eyes than me. Maili? Maili, can you read the end? By the way, uh, Assistant Secretary Livingston Alcantara of the Department of Migrant Workers is also online, but he has not posted that question yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Maylie, can you read the question? Hello. 
Um, sir, bali si Sir Toots po kasi ay may meeting daw po. So, um, he just sent a question po for, uh, for the presenter. So, um, his question is, um, for Dr. Acosta specifically, the Philippines has recently seen an influx of workers from China and other ASEAN countries like Malaysia and Indonesia coming to work in the Philippine offshore gaming operators or POGOS. Will the past government welcome this migration? There seems to be growing concern and pushback from Filipinos. In the context of global skills partnerships, how can the Philippines balance the economic benefits that the POGO industry and foreign workers may bring with the need to ensure the social cohesion, economic opportunities, and well-being of local Filipino com communities? What are some of the key issues that need to be addressed to create a sustainable, mutually beneficial arrangement and are there any lessons or best practices from other global skills partnerships around the world that could be applicable here? Okay. Uh, is there anyone would like to ask before we give the floor to the Pablo and, 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 and Limon? Uh, any more questions? Do you, do you have questions maybe? So you can answer them in one sweep <laughs> later. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, first off, congratulations, uh, Dr. Acosta and uh, Limon, for, you guys, you know, for that very insightful presentation and paper. My concern really is quite general, given the presentations and, of course, the insights from our discussions. Uh, we are looking at GSP, you know, uh, and you have mentioned all those um, benefits accruing to both the sending and receiving economies. Unfortunately, I think at the back of our minds, we have this concern about the opposite effect of GSP. For example, uh, instead of us mitigating brain drain in our sending economies and possibly uh, labor market distortions, no, uh, we may be promoting such if we don't balance our interventions with regard to, as what uh, Dr. Rivera mentioned earlier, uh, concerns on both the demand and uh, supply side of the scheme of things. Um, maybe uh, a more radical approach is us focusing more on actual migrants rather than potential migrants. So we are looking at augmenting skills within the sending economies through education, human capital investments, uh, et cetera, et cetera, better matching. But really, such may be uh, more uh, disadvantageous to, to a lot of the developing economies. Maybe it's worth focusing more on the actual migrants now for them to have the ability to, to be mobile uh, if they are given the tools to be upskilled. So I think that's that's a concern. For example, the Philippines has been sending less skilled workers abroad. And when they're there, they stick to that uh, profession. May it be paying them a lot less compared to the uh, what skilled positions available supposedly to them. But uh, we have been seeing lesser interventions with regard to their supposed upskilling you know, or retooling or capacity uh, building. So I guess that's an entry point for intervention. A lesser, uh, what, possibly a lesser popular alternative in terms of the developing uh, economy, well, the developed economies intervening or even given the GSP program that we have globally. Yeah. So that may be, I think, the lesser uh, traditional no? or the more radical approach in terms of looking at uh, GSP and possibly having that win-win situation because I think the natural tendency if we're going forward with basic GSP is for us to actually reinforce imbalances within the set, within the sending economies. No. We may be improving uh, human capital within the sending economies, but I think the big chance for them to actually not benefit from this is 
uh, is quite high. No? And that includes, of course, really reinforcing brain, brain drain and uh, further cultivating that imbalance so in terms of the local labor market, distortion-wise. Uh, thank you. Congratulations in your paper, and uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. So I have two questions and one comment. Uh, the first comment is uh, uh, similar to JP's uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I really appreciate the how you mentioned or discussed the the role of the the U.S. policy that uh, increasingly um, that sharply increased the, the 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 migration of nurses. It reminded me of Todaro's theory of rural urban migration back in uh, and years ago that uh, you know the push and pull factors are really the ones determining the so the likelihood of getting employed in the destination country is the one that's really pulling the the migrants and somehow that is reinforced by by that uh, presentation so uh, thank you very much for that uh, but uh, that so two questions is I think there was a mention of social services and social protection in the in one of the slides, but I would like to hear more about that because in in an earlier PIDS study that was funded by PASC and I remember we talked about the transferability of uh, social services or social protection for migrants. Um, one thing that uh, um, the less one of the lessons for Filipino migrants is that if they are um, based in in the country where they are working, for example, in Japan, they don't understand how that uh, the the social insurance can be used. The the Philippine social insurance, whether it can be used in in the destination country, or whether if they are paying for insurance in Japan, whether it can be used if ever if ever they can go back to the Philippines. So, um, what what lessons have you learned about the transferability of those um social services like insurance and other social protection uh services? The second is um, um very interesting that uh the, the migration inside East Asia is not very high no the it we 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 migrate outside um but in we're trying to form an east asian community no the asia community so what lessons or have how have the mutual recognition agreements in asean um contributed or not contributed or what what's missing in the mres so in, to foster an intra asean uh, migration okay uh let me just add to that chicken complete. <laughs> so maybe uh, uh, I, I I hope uh, you're perhaps you are aiming to have a a template uh, GSP agreements that pe the countries can use, and uh, towards that you uh, you you have actually well, as Limon has already mentioned documenting these partnerships, and. Uh, we would, uh, I think it will be very useful to identify the designs and the performance. I think uh, I was mentioned that we have one, but uh, we don't really know and, and publicize this so that people will know with open eyes, know what are the costs and benefits. And like, for example, the fears that this might find further brain drain rather than manage it well. So those... So uh, the experience of the current experience will be very useful. So the design elements, as well as the performance, will be very important for countries to 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 uh, to embrace uh, GSP as as a as a solution to the perennial uh, problems with uh, migration and all of that. Uh, I would also like. Uh, uh, I, there are several attempts, but I haven't seen sustained effort. Uh, I, I said uh, maybe you, you mentioned one that has 20,000, but the, the Philippine-Korea thing is very thin, I think. Or there's attempts for Japan, agreement with Japan that does not. So basically, what are the emerging uh, motivations and, 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 and cost-sharing arrangements and this sustainability of this cost-sharing arrangements uh, what's the performance of that? That would be very, I think, very useful uh, for for countries who wants to expand uh, GSP agreements. Because as I, I think it's, it's 
there is also one uh, I'll mention the German one. There is an effort, serious, very serious effort with Canada on 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 nursing uh, migrants as well. But the back down, I think, on whether they should be paying for uh, training of nurses in the Philippines or not. Or, or, so the basically the agreements on cost sharing is is good. So uh uh you have uh, I don't know how you will, but but uh, I'll leave it to you to you respond to all these comments. Yeah, thanks. No, I will try. I will try and thank you. This is a great debate, and I want to also thanks for the thoughtful questions of everyone and and especially the those who took the time no la, to read thoroughly and uh, uh, like you know Dr. Tabuga and Dr. Rivera. Uh, let me start with a few reflections and maybe you know uh, later you can compliment Limon. Um, first of all, I think that, um, well, I want to start with the last one. Yes, of course, this is what you're getting is a preview of a report that will hopefully come up in September with all the lessons and design features about this, this, uh, these programs and including, of course, the when it makes sense to think about GSP, which is, I have to say, is not every context in every sector. So GSP is not going to solve all your problems. It's not a, the panacea. But in certain sectors, in certain conditions, may 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 make sense to have GSPs, and that's what we are trying to do in this report. And and when you countries decide to go that, what have we learned from the lessons from the existing experiences, um, and and also the the new goals. Uh, I want to say that GSPs are not actually new. I mean, it's true. We are referring to and we presenting today mostly what we call G to G or government to government. But this type of scheme have existed in the private sector for many long time. So you think about multinationals, you know, that have operations in different countries. They train a lot of local workers. Some of them have the opportunity to work in headquarters. So we, the World Bank, are HSP in that sense. We have a lot of workers that we that work and come to work in the Philippine office, and some of them migrate to the U.S. to headquarters, you no, know, and continue their career. So in that profit, you are, we think we are building human capital in the sense that you are providing opportunities for people to move. The same, you know, in other settings that we document, like football academies is also very, very common. You have, uh, in, especially in, 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 in soccer, no? in football, you have, uh, and basketball as well, these uh, academies that, you know, you spot, you train a lot of kids to work on certain, on certain sports, and then some of them may have the chance to migrate, some of them stay. And those who stay are also benefit the national teams, no? Because they got trained with the highest standards. They were exposed to to how Barcelona, Real Madrid, or or NBA uh, 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 looks at at this uh, at this at the, at the sports, and then you know apply that to the local labor market. Um, the other the other observation I want to do that I mean, and I and I go over a bit in order. I mean, you mentioned Dr. Tabug about the examples, yes, including the sheer Germany. Uh, Philippines is, is one of them. I mean, we didn't, we didn't include that because we got details also very late, but they, it will be in the report. Um, again, the, the, the situation of nurses is a very interesting one because, and, and again, that's what I'm stressing, does it make to have GSPs in every single sector or not? I mean, and, and, I mean and it's a debate that you will have to, to have. Um, Philippines has specialized in nurses so for quite a significant time. So it may, you may not need to have GSPs for nursing. GSP may, may be more useful for new sectors that you want to specialize. So now, for instance, a lot of uh, are talking about the, the environmental climate change is going to need a lot of new green jobs that will have to be developed. And these are you know sectors that typically there are not only global shortages, but little expertise on how to to start training workers on that, like solar panel, no construction, installation, um, smart agriculture. So, so these are new sectors that a country may try to specialize. And GSP is a useful way to to jump ahead instead of waiting 50 years to develop the expertise like Philippines have with nurses. If Philippines wants to play a role in that particular sector, a GSP can bring the standard quickly of what is demanded abroad, and then it build the, the the human capacity base. And um, uh, I mean, it's a different discussion as well on the cost sharing. Uh, we think that at the end of the day, most of this scheme needs to be really cost shared by the by the countries of destination and including the migrants themselves. I think it was one of the suggestions. I think it was Dr. Rivera, which is true. It's, it's a valid proposition. Again, you, you probably don't want to start at the beginning charging prospective migrants because there is a lot of uncertainties on the way. But but eventually, as the, as the schemes mature, 
uh, this is a proposition that needs to be put in place. But certainly the, the countries of destination, because they are benefiting from these schemes. And, um, and now and now Philippines has established such a chart record on nursing that may also start asking for contributions no? <laughs> for the skill development of most nurses. So it's a decision that you you will have to, to make. You mentioned, uh, Dr. Tabuga, about the, what happened to those who unfortunately may not be able to migrate, which is a reality. Uh, if you think about the GSPs, the, the model is you train 100 workers, uh, uh, 20 may migrate, 80 may stay. Typically, the, the 20 that are migrate are probably the best students on that cohort. Uh, but still, the other 80 may not be the best, but they can be valuable in the local economy. The key here, of course, is that as long as the standards of the instruction are, are of high quality, they, they should be demanded locally. Uh, it should be in sectors. That's why you want a GSP to be in sectors that have the that have a, a local labor demand. You don't want to specialize in sectors that where there is no demand uh, locally, because then you can generate frustration, and uh, and it can generate, of course, uh, problems down the way. So the selection of the sector is key. The establishing the quality standards is key, and getting the the right level of instruction, of course, is key. Uh, so again, we these are things that we will discuss in the report. You mentioned also having local employers uh, in, in board. I agree totally. Both local employers and international employers uh, need to be to be on board. And again, the brain drain. You mentioned several times of many of you brain drain. And I and I want to clarify something on this. Maybe, maybe you may not agree, but I mean I, I'm a bit a, I have a very firm position on this. I think by the when you talk about brain drain, you need to, to talk about of GSP, we need to talk about the counterfactual. The counterfactual without GSP, so without these schemes in place, you know, people are going to migrate anyway. And this is basically generating, per definition, uh, brain drain. So you don't have, uh, let's say you're concerned about nurses' brain drain. Without GSP, you know, you will have a nursing brain drain in that sense. People are specializing in nursing and then migrating. But the, the GSP is bringing to the table the opportunity to train additional pools of workers. So it's not going to solve completely brain drain situation, but it will mitigate it. So without brain drain, without without GSP, you still will have a brain drain. With GSP, you may have a, a brain drain, but it's in a lower extent because you're increasing the pool. And as I mentioned, the example of 80-20, by definition, you're going to be, of course, uh, uh, ex expanding the pool. Now, the other interesting discussion, which is a much bigger debate, and I agree here, at least in the paper that on nursing, I didn't have time to, to present quickly, but... Uh, is whether brain drain, whether GSPs may distort the incentives for people to uh, specialize in sector, sectors as opposed to others. And that is a very valid question. I had the same question when I was reading the paper on the nurses. The authors in that case, they show, look, but still people are getting degrees in business, in finance, in other, in other disciplines. Because what I wanted to understand is by creating the incentive to be a nurse, basically people stop uh, studying other needed disciplines, no? And again, um, this is a valid question, but at the end of the day, my my position is it's going to be difficult to fight the markets, no? The, you, you cannot fight the markets. I mean, you can, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to tell people not to specialize on certain occupations because we want them to be, you know, uh, 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 specialize in finance. If the demand is not there, the market will tell people where to go. And you are, what you are doing here is an opening a new market. Um, so that will generate, of course, a, a pull factors. And, and eventually, what you need to do is, is, is try to get the best out of that. Um, some, of the, some of the discussion that Dr. Rivera was mentioning is sometimes it's not very different to the trade, agree, uh, the trade discussion. No? So it's liberalizing versus protecting. Uh, certain, certain, uh, uh, the, the trade of certain goods and services, and um, and again, I I personally feel that you know we the more restriction we put to, for people to migrate, the people will find other ways that are not going to be less ideal. And again, in some sense, I mean, this is also related to some of the suggestion about the exit tax, which I'm not saying that it may not work in the Philippines. I mean, this, every country is different, and there is a context. One of the advantages in that sense for getting a tax and exit tax in the Philippines is that you are an island country. So people, you control a bit who moves out away from, because they had to go to airports mostly. In Imagine land countries with a lot of borders 
the only thing when you try to put an exit tax is going to generate that people try to uh, migrate uh, undocumented and, uh, and uh, to avoid paying taxes. No, so again, uh, I feel that the more restrictions you put, it, it's generally going to be more complicated. I think that what we need to create is an education system that provides uh, good quality, uh, good quality um, uh, training. And, the, and 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 markets will dictate how many should be looking opportunities abroad, how many will will stay at home. I mean, again, empl employers are concerned about uh, not finding enough workers in certain sectors. It's probably they are also paying too low. If there is demand, and uh, I'm an economist, I'm very strict on that sense. If there is a hard return on certain occupation, you know, you need to pay the worker what they deserve. Otherwise, if there is an upside option for the worker, it's very valid for them to migrate. So instead of seeing it as, as a situation where you need to put restrictions, it's basically trying to, to foster that in a way that it creates more incentive for people to specialize in certain occupations and get quality education. Um, what else I wanted to say? So there were two other um, questions on from what I think, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Domingo, I kind of answered that. I mean, my position on that front on the discussion on brain drain, but uh, uh, we can, of course, continue on the size if needed. Um, Dr. Recto, you mentioned about the, the social services and social protection. These are very important as schemes that, that need to be put in place. It's very difficult. The reality is, is when, when we talk about migration and, uh, and agreements, the two most difficult are skill recognition and portability of social insurance because these are really hard to crack and get agreements across the countries. Uh, so what we are saying, if, if you're gonna do a GSP model, for sure try to embed this in the agreements, no? because what you don't want is that this is not defined and then workers start uh, making contributions abroad, but then when they come back, they cannot really get the portability aspect. But, but uh, these, are hard. These, are hard, these are hard things that, um, that uh, that we need to think. And on the movement intra ASEAN, this is a very interesting question. What can we do? I mean, that will re probably require a, a, another type of research, but I can tell you something that don't think that agreements in paper will automatically foster labor mobility. And when I give you an example from my own home region in Latin America, you know, all the it's very, you have open movement in Latin America. Everybody can move, everybody, we speak all Spanish. We, we recognize our degrees, it's still intra-regional is very, is very low because the, the income differentials are mostly the ones that are, are gonna be driving uh, uh, people to move. And you know, if I move from Argentina to Brazil, my income differential is, is pretty much very low, 10%, 20% more I will get. I will not get this 200% that I was showing. The only way to do that is when you move to uh, high income economies. And that's why I think the, the, is explaining a lot of the movements within the region. Uh, but certainly there could be other aspects that we need to look at in more closely. If there are some uh, artificial roadblocks that by removing them, it will allow more intra-regional migration. That's something that I think ASEAN should be looking at. Um, and finally, um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Orbeta, I mentioned about the um, the co-sharing agreements. And again, this, this is something that we are seeing more interest across countries. And, uh, and um, it's not gonna be necessarily on the largest scale. Again, it's not a panacea, it's, it's for certain sector, certain uh, certain context. It's not a substitute GSP of migration policy because I think you, some of you were, I, I don't recall if what you, Dr. Domingo, that was saying we should focus more on on facilitating the life of the existing migrant. Yes, you need, we need to do that, irrespectively of GSP. I think we need to, to continue caring about our workers and facilitating. But uh, I think that there is much broader opportunities when the, the, the migrant have the sufficient skill because it's, they are better match, and you will get more out of that migration. So you can still rely on low skill migrants. You know that the return is gonna be lower to the economy from that. Uh, the moment you are you are moving into higher skilled migrants, it's the same as again trade. You can be a primary exporter of commodity, or you can you know be exporter of manufactured processed products. No, in a way, higher value added, higher content. You know, it has tend to have higher returns. So 
and of course it, it, for, it, it helps also on the on other aspects like including uh, protection aspects etc because the the higher skill the, the the our migrants are they know also how to navigate the the situations at destination and will rely less on the needs of the state in this case of the philippines to constantly monitor and provide service but but it, that's something that is a debate uh, and depends of course on different on different contexts uh, i think i responded i mean there was this question about the uh, china um i mean i i can tell you only one thing if you want your workers to migrate you also need to accept others to come to your country it's not a one-way street so you cannot get everything so i think i will be very surprised that the filipinos are opposing migrants. It will be the the, the most uh, counterintuitive thing that I could find because Filipinos are naturally uh, like to migrate and and go to different parts of the world. So we also need to accept that maybe, I mean, there may be reasons. I don't know the details, but if there are can't workers from China and Malaysia coming to work in the Philippines, let's look at the in a positive way. No, I mean it's it's part of life. Philippines. Is not just a, a, a sending migrant country; it's actually now receiving migrants, which is, you know, another natural evolution. And uh, and let's take the the way for that. It's okay. I think I didn't leave you any chance. You wanna yeah, add but, something? But yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, you know, um, share a few thoughts. So thanks for your insightful um insight insightful comments and questions. So with regard to record on domestic employment, for instance, APTC started off with a focus on development assistance. So from the get-go, it was focused on increasing the domestic employment. So, so far, we've been seeing that in terms of domestic employment, in the region of 85% you know, are employed domestically in the Pacific Island countries to a fair point on brain drain. And so far, the share of labor mobility is less than 5%. And in fact, the challenge is to increase the share of labor mobility because that's where we'll be able to maximize you know, the gains you know, more fully of, of, of labor mobility. Um, the second bit is, the second example is Palim. In fact, like the employment rate is about 80%. Most of them are, you know, working domestically. In fact, um, as of last year, two worked in Belgium and the plan is for this year, there will be a stock. You know? There will be 18 more you know, who will be working in Belgium because uh, the number you know, of, of, of trainees you know, um, was 120. So we're looking at you know, a share of, share of domestic employment, a uh, share of employment you know, uh, leaning towards domestic employment so far. So second, um, to your question uh, on you know, coordination with supply side. So they work closely you know, with, uh, say, the training providers and with the uh, with the trainees, no, and I think that the, the the more important challenge is coordination on linking, no, both the supply and the demand to make sure that what the employers demand are in fact what the training providers are equipping the trainees with. And there's this point um, on you know we're sending work, Philippines is sending workers. We might need to increase our capacity, no, human development capacity, our, our training capacity, and. You may be familiar with the Private Sector Advisory Committee. So the Department of Migrant Workers um, is part of this PSAC. And I think people from the private sector are also part of this. No? And one of the recommendations is you know, for these receiving countries no, to invest no, in the human development capacity, uh, development capacity no, of, uh, of, of, of sending countries such as the Philippines. For instance, they are exploring the options of adopt hospital or adopt schools. So on we are building no uh, we are building a pool no of local workers for domestic markets and not just no for 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 foreign labor markets and with regard to upskilling no the existing stock of migrants um recently dmw is or in in in, in the larger ecosystem the government is and, and and other TVET providers are having this, you know, overseas technical and vocational institutes, you no, know, in the countries of destination, in destination countries. The challenge is how to make sure that you know the skills that are migrants, that the Filipino migrants are uh, being equipped with, you know, in these training centers are recognized in destination countries. So there are movement, or there 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 are measures that are being taken place, you not know, to upskill them, you no, know, uh, in uh, in the destination countries. The challenge is how to 
uh, you know, the, the challenge of skill recognition. How do how do we translate you not know, these skills training into into credentials, qualifications are recognized in the destination. And with regard to social protection, social insurance, one good example is you know seafarers. You know, about thirty percent, one third of the seafarers globally are in fact Filipinos. And in terms of portability of social of insurance, um, we found that they have this PNI in them a PNI club system whereby regardless of your uh you know uh the flag state no your 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 sailing in your insurance no uh, as a seafarer no can be can be availed no in uh in 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 in, in every flag of uh destination country that you are that you are that you are in so that's an example of a transferability or portability of your social insurance and MRAs to begin with if there are existing MRAs, we leverage them no, in the GSPs because you know we have we 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 should we should not no, attempt to reinvent the wheel. No, we we should uh, leverage no what's ex what is existing. But that said, right, um, MRAs can be costly and they can be time intensive. Um, as as you may know, there are you know um, MRAs no mutual recognition agreements in ASEAN, but only two. Uh, professions no, are getting the most traction, no, engineering, and if I'm not mistaken, accountancy. And some of the reasons no, for, for the lack of traction no, in MRAs in ASEAN include diverging standards, and there's some interest groups no, that uh, would like to restrict certain professions for their citizens only, for example, lawyers. So, and once you have MRAs, of course, the, 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 to negotiate MRAs, you know, it, it, it can take you, it can take time, and once you have MRAs, there there needs to be an enforcement body, and you know that takes resources. And when there are like changes no, in the professions, in the re requirements, that will take time again, no, uh, in terms of you know uh, renegotiation, no? renegotiating the agreements. So, but but, but I think that the, the the message here is if there are existing MRAs, leverage them. Um, otherwise, you know. We we need to keep in mind, no. While there are benefits, no, and there are benefits, no, for for MRAs, no. Um, there are examples from, you know, um, um, the European Union, that you know the the MRAs, no, their automatic recognition of qualifications helps to improve, no. That helps to generate uh benefits, no, for 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 the countries, no, for the member countries, but there are also you know the 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 what they call this the disadvantages or like the minuses no in terms of like the cost no the resource implications of 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 building new MRAs, um and sustainability one good example is the GIZ no between uh you know nurses in the nursing sector and in fact it's a good example of funding by employers no by the destination so employers no, in Germany no are in fact like shouldering say the language training the movement from the Philippines to the destination you know the uh the Accreditation, no? the recognition of their qualifications in the destination. For the most part, they are shouldering the most of the expenses, no, under this uh training for labor mobility program. And yeah, I I just like to end by saying that GSP, of course, as Pablo indicated, GSP is not a panacea. There own there are certain conditions that need to be met, no, for GSPs, no, to be to 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 generate the uh, the gain to for for G GSPs to maximize the gain. For some, it may the answer might not be GSPs. But if GSP might be the answer, it's not the end. It's a means to an end. And that end could be like in your broader development goals. You need to build the human capital you're in, in the country, and that will, for say, say, help attract foreign direct investments or to move up the value chain in terms of like boosting the country services sector. So you, we know that in the in the business process outsourcing sector, there are you know risks of automation. So the challenge is how do we level the game, no? So that you know the, the we 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 the the, the workers, no? We minimize the, the 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 risks, no? From automation and we make sure that you know our the the Filipinos, um, you know, in, in working in the BPO sector, no, are equipped with uh, you know additional skills, not digital skills, no, artificial intelligence skills, etc. To to compete, no, uh, in, in this in the in the, in this space. Anything else? Anybody else would like to? No? We do, I think we don't have any more time. For we have to go, right? Fortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we'd like to thank uh, Pablo and and Limon for for sharing their their, their uh, time and and the knowledge to us uh, this morning, and appreciate the 
dropping by the office so you can have uh, other opportunities next time when you swing by this we want to because... actually do a, a formal presentation when we have the big report so hopefully we can be soon again in, in philippines